I've not done this one in a long time either, so pray for me. Savior, I come, quiet my soul. Remember, redemption's heal where your blood was spilled for my ransom. Everything I once held dear, I count it all is lost. Lead me to the cross where your blood poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me. Lead me to the cross. Amen. We're going to be turning the uh, order to service over uh, to the breaking of the bread. So I'm going to call on Brother Brian, if he would, to come. And uh, he'll be bringing the message down. I want you to pray for him and encourage him with a hand clap for the Lord and, and him. And uh, I've known him for a while, but uh, never got to hear him preach. So it's be my Thank first time. Thank you. Love you, brother. I'll bring you what? Yeah, please do. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to begin by saying that uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be here before you today. Uh, again, my name is uh, Brian Bishop, and I know probably very, I don't think anybody here really knows me, maybe a couple of you, uh, but uh, 
God, uh, I'm from Johnson County, and uh, God called me to preach in 1985. I started pastoring in 1989, and um, pastored 33 years. And I, I was away all that time. I, I went away and uh, pastored in different states. Thank you, brother. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I moved back to this area. Uh, there was an opening at uh, Pikeville Medical Center for a uh, chaplain position. And uh, so I was, at the time, I was pastoring in Tennessee in a little town called Dixon, right outside of Nashville, Tennessee. And I decided to come back up here in, in my home area. I always wanted to come back. Uh, my son, Joshua, already lived here. Uh, he went off to... Uh, Appalachian Bible College in Beckley, West Virginia to uh, become a, uh, to get a degree in youth pastoring. And uh, he met a Pikeful girl there, and uh, so he moved here and uh, lived, uh, it lives in Johns Creek area where my dad grew up, and my mom grew up in Joe's Creek. And so I have uh, three grandchildren uh, by Joshua and his wife, and uh, he just had a baby just about a week and a half ago. His name is JC. He is in the uh, hospital right now. He was a, a preemie, so pray for him. But he's doing pretty good. Um, so about a, a year and a half or so before I moved here, my daughter, my youngest daughter Bethany moved here. And uh, then about three or four months ago, my daughter Rebecca, who's with me this morning, she moved here. So uh, God's just kind of put us all together again. I'm a current member at Bowman Free Will Baptist, and, uh, and I have been going around uh, the last probably three months preaching different places. Um, I, I'm kind of, uh, it's a little bit unusual. It's been a journey uh, because I've pastored all those years, and uh, so I'm just seeing what God has for me. Um, but the Lord has been so good to me. Uh, I have preached seven straight Sunday mornings at different churches, and today's the eighth. I did not come here to preach, uh, but the pastor asked me if I would, and so uh, I said, yeah, I sure will. I'll be glad to. Uh, I have been married 35 years. Uh, last Sunday was my wedding anniversary, and... Um, my wife asked me Sunday morning, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about her in just a second. She asked me Sunday morning, she said, Honey, after 35 years, do you still love me? And I said, I sure do. And uh, we got to talking a little bit, and I said, Well, honey, after 35 years, have you ever thought about divorce? And she said, No, but I've thought about murder. <laughs> so, but my wife, uh, I actually work for her. Um, she has multiple sclerosis. She is bed fast, hasn't walked in 20 years. And um, so I am her home health aide. I get paid to take care of her by the state of Kentucky. And so we desire your prayers. It's not an easy road. Uh, but again, I'm so grateful to be here this morning and uh, to be able to share the Word of God with you. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to Luke chapter 16, a very familiar passage in the Bible. <clears throat> Luke chapter 16, and we will begin reading at... Verse 19, Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table Moreover, the dogs came and licked his swords. And it came to pass that the, the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame 
And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may also testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. I want to share with you, uh, and I desire your prayers this morning, message entitled this morning, Five Things in Hell That We Need in the Church. Five Things in Hell That We Need in the Church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, as I just humbly bow my presence before you, Lord, I thank you and praise you for the opportunity to share the Word of God to this wonderful group of, of godly Christian people. Lord, we praise you and thank you. We praise you and thank you. Lord, I just uh, ask you now that you would move me out of the way and may the Holy Spirit have his way today. Father, I pray that, uh, Lord, we ask for the Holy Spirit to aid us and help us. Father, for without you we can do nothing. So, Father, I pray that uh, the Spirit of the Lord would be strong here this morning. For we know where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Now, Father, I pray now that you give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you might begin this morning by saying, Well, Brother Brian, what in the world could be in hell that we need in the church? Well, I'm going to share with you five things this morning from the Word of God that's in hell right now that we need in the church. Here in Luke chapter 16, Jesus describes the life, death, and destiny of two men. He describes how they lived, how they died, and what their destinies were beyond death. Uh, but as we look at this this morning, the pauper in this story, in this passage, is not Lazarus. But the pauper in this story is the man in the big house. Because as sick as he was... And as hungry as he was, and as near death as he was, he is far better off than the man in the big house. Because the difference between wealth and poverty in the eyes of God is whether a man knows Jesus Christ or knows him not. A man may be sick, but if he knows God, he's well and so. A man may be poor, but if he knows God, he's wealthy and so. A man may be dying, but he'll live forever if he's right with God. Matter of fact, we're all going to live forever. Uh, so it's all about location, location, location. Where are you going to be in eternity? So as we look at this passage this morning, I want to share with you first, the first thing that we find in hell that we need in the church, and that is verse 24. We find the words there, and he cried. There are tears in hell right now that we need in the church. See, the Bible tells us in Matthew 8, 12, uh, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness and there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. How long has it been, beloved, since you had a burden over a lost loved one uh, and, and you wept for them to be saved? The lost might say to us today, as the disciples mistakenly said to Jesus when they were out in the sea and the boat was raging and they thought they all were going to die. And, and the disciples said, Lord, carest thou not that we perish? I'm reminded in, Rome, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 where Paul wrote to the problem-plagued church at Corinth 
Verse 4 said, For out of, uh, uh, out of much affliction and anguish of my heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, Paul said. And so with all the problems that the Corinthian church had, Paul challenged them with the word of God in his tears. Oh, beloved, this morning we need to have tears for lost souls in our churches today. Because when we have tears, it means that our hearts are broken and we have a contrite spirit uh, in which God can use us in a mighty way. But when our hearts have become hardened through sin, that is when God cannot use us because the tears of our hearts have long since dried up and went away. I'm reminded of an evangelist back uh, years ago by the name of John Vesson. He was out of Ireland. And one day he went soul winning. He went knocking on doors. And he went to a door and began telling somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ. And they slammed the door on his face. He walked down to the porch and sat down, tears flowing down his eyes, and he penned these words. But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away. It's all that I can do. Beloved, we need to have tears today that, uh, uh, in the church as they are now in hell. Someone once said that we shed more tears over TV or movies or made up tragedies than we do in real life tragedies of people dying in sin. I'm reminded uh, a while back when I was working at PMC as a chaplain, one day I got a trauma call and I went down uh, into the emergency room and a husband and wife came in. They're, they had ran over into a creek and the wife just had barely a scratch or two on her but the husband had to go immediately into surgery. About 30 minutes later, two of the surgeons contacted me and said, Chaplain, this man has died and I want you to go with us as we go tell his wife. And I remember as I, I, I went in there with the surgeons and of course they had no idea that, uh, the lady had no idea that her husband had died in this wreck. And, uh, and as, the, as it went, the, the surgeon uh, you know, didn't beat around the bush. He just got down on his knees by her bed. And he said, ma'am, I'm sorry, but your husband didn't make it. And I remember when he made that statement, uh, the man's mom and dad was sitting in the room with her. And they all just wailed out uh, an eerie uh, scream. And, and, and everybody there started crying. And that was when we had the mask on and... Uh, I, didn't know, I didn't know what to say. And by the way, sometimes uh, it's best not to say anything. But I remember uh, as everybody was crying, uh, I, I had tears flowing down my eyes. And uh, the, the, uh, the lady that was there, her husband had died. And she looked up at me and she said, Chaplain, I'm so glad that you're here with me today. I never said a word to her. I didn't know what to say. What do you say when that happens? There's nothing you can say. But all that she needed to know was that we cared and that we were concerned. But they were tears flowing down my eyes. I remember when I was pastoring in Tennessee a few years ago. We had a, we had a service one day and... There's an eight-year-old boy by the name of Max came to the altar and got saved, gave his heart to the Lord. And everybody was, was rejoicing and, uh, you know, I prayed with Max and I, he stood up and I said, Max, before the people, I said, Max, did you ask Jesus to come into your heart? He said, yeah. I said, Max, do you believe that Jesus died on the third day uh, on Calvary, died on Calvary at the cross and arose on the third day? And he said, Yes. And I said, Max, did you accept him as your Savior? And he said, yes. And, uh, I went, and of course, I always say when that happens, I say, well, the Bible says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. And I said, Max, by according to your testimony and according to the truth of the Word of God, you just got saved. 
Well, something happened that I wasn't expecting. Max got back down at the altar and started crying. And I got down there by him. I said, Max, what's wrong? And Max stood up just about halfway and turned around. His dad was over on this, uh, the left side of the church and his dad was unsaved and Max crying with tears coming down his eyes. He said, I want my daddy to get saved. And just that moment, his dad came up and kneeled down at the altar and gave his heart to the Lord. And beloved, I said all that to say this, don't ever underestimate the power of tears. There is tears in hell that we need in the church. Jeremiah 9, one. We, we need to pray the prayer like Jeremiah prayed when he said, Oh, that my head were waters and that my eyes were fountains of tears that I may weep day and night for my people. Do you have tears today? Because there's tears in hell that we need in the church. Number two, there's also prayer in hell that we need in the church. And we find that in verse uh, 24. We see there the Bible says that he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. We also find it um, in verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. So beloved, there is prayer in hell right now that we need in the church. Listen, I've been a part years ago when I was a young boy of many great prayer meetings. I've been in revivals where they would last two and three weeks and see 25 and 35 people get saved and join the church and get baptized the following Sunday. I've been in just a few great prayer meetings in my life, but the greatest prayer meeting of all time is going on right now in Hell for millions upon millions are crying out to God right now. <clears throat> they are screaming. They are uh, wailing out their agonies to God in prayer. And this, their prayers are most sincere. They are, it is coming from the very depths of their hearts. They're down on their faces humbly before God. And in their voices they are most desperate in their cries, there is an urgency. Their prayers become eerie screams. I've never been there and I don't plan on going by the grace and mercy and forgiveness of God. But I got a feeling it may go something like this. Oh God, oh God, please forgive me. Oh God, oh God, let me out of this place. Oh God, oh God, have mercy upon my soul. Oh God, just please let me die. But beloved, in hell, there is no forgiveness. In hell... There are no answered prayers. In hell, there is no mercy. And in hell, the Bible says, the soul never dies. Their prayers will go on and on for all eternity. And God will never hear their voice or their cries, nor their wailing, because they are eternally separated from God. As the church today, we need to pray like the people in hell are doing right now. But there's conditions to prayer. You see, number one, you cannot live wrong and pray right. It doesn't work that way. So we must live right. There must be an obedience to the Word of God and to the Spirit of God in our life if our prayers are to be answered. 2 Chronicles 7, uh, 14 gives us another 
uh, condition to prayer, and that is that we must be humble. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray and seek my face, then uh, I, and turn from their wicked ways, I will he, uh, hear from heaven. They will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. <clears throat> so we must have a humble heart if you want your prayers to be answered. In Jeremiah 23, 13, the Bible tells us that we must pray wholeheartedly. Jeremiah said, and ye shall seek, God, God was saying this through Jeremiah, and ye shall seek me and find me if you uh, shall search for me with all of your heart. Revelation 3, 16, Jesus said, because ye are lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Listen, beloved, if our prayers are are lukewarm, God will not hear them. He wants our prayers to be wholehearted. Thirdly, our prayers must be by faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So in hell, uh, uh, there is unanswered prayer but here on earth there can be answer to God to our prayers when we meet the right conditions another condition is is that we again must be obedient James 5 16 says for the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much now let's look at those two words because these are words that we normally don't use uh, the word effectual what does that mean well that means passionate and the word fervent means intensity. So it could be said that the passionate, intensified prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So in hell there is unanswered prayer for them because it is everlasting too late. But our prayers can still be answered and be successful if these conditions are met. There is prayer in hell that we need in the church. Thirdly, there is fire in hell. Verse 24 says, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger, cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. There is fire in hell that we need in the church. In the ministry of Jeremiah, he was known as the weeping prophet, but he also had fire in his soul. You see, he got to the place where uh, he, he got discouraged. He had preached for 70 years and never saw anybody went, got win or uh, came to the Lord. And he said in, in Jeremiah 29, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But the Bible says, But his word was in my heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones. Now, if he'd have been a free will Baptist, they'd have fired him a long time ago. Because he hadn't seen anybody saved in 70 years. But let me share something with you, beloved. Did you know it's not up to the pastor to grow the church? Let me give you two biblical examples of that in case there's some of you that think that. Number one, remember, Paul said this, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It doesn't say I planted, Apollos watered, but the pastor gave the increase. No. God gave the increase. In the book of Acts chapter 2, the Bible tells us where there were thousands of people saved. And the Bible says, And the Lord added to the church daily, as such should be saved. That is not the pastor, that is not the preacher, but it is the Lord. So when a church grows, and when people get saved, it is not the pastor, but it is God that does the work. Just thought I'd throw that in there, chase that rabbit, no extra charge. <laughs> well, let me share with you about the fire a minute. Did you know that there's people that run up and down this country, all over the world, that think that death, death ends it all? 
Listen, beloved, if I lived how some people lived, I'd hope there wasn't a God. I'd hope there wasn't a hell. I'd hope there wasn't a judgment day. But the fact is, death does not end it all. It only ushers you into a place of eternity. And if you are lost, that eternal state, if you are lost, that state is hell. You know, there's a big difference between the fire of hell than there is natural fire. You see, the fire of hell does not produce light. Matthew chapter 8 verse 12 says that hell is a world of outer darkness. Natural fire produces light. I could turn out all the lights in this building and strike a lighter and every one of you would see the light. Why? Because natural fire produces light. Hell fire uh, is not only a world of outer darkness does not produce light, but it also does not consume those burning in it. Revelation tells us that those that go to hell, that John said that the smoke of their torment will go up forever and forever. But we know that fire in the natural state is temporal. I remember years ago when I was pastoring in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. We had a little trailer behind our church that they had used for Sunday school. They had built new Sunday school rooms and they said, let's go burn that trailer down. So there's four or five guys went out one day. We brought in the fire department and they were there and they lit that uh, trailer 12 by 65. Within seven minutes, it was burnt to the ground. Seven minutes. So the fire that we know here uh, in the natural realm uh, consumes those burning in it. I could take gasoline and pour over this pulpit and I could light a match to it and just in a few minutes by the power of the fire and the smoke and the heat would break down the, 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 the structure of this wood uh, all the way down to ashes. And so the fire of hell does not consume those burning in it. But the natural realm, the fire does burn those things in it. But listen, beloved, if hell fire wasn't enough for people to be tormented forever and ever, and it is, memory alone would be torture and torment of mind. I have known people over the years that are in mental institutions because of their memory. I have known people to put pills in their mouth uh, uh, and overdose because of, the, of their memory. I have known people to turn the gas on the stove and light a match. I've known people to put a revolver to their head and pull the trigger because of memory. I've known people uh, that would run their car over a cliff because of memory. Change homes, change jobs, all because of memory's power. Beloved, those that are in hell right now, they remember every time that they were in church and they heard the man of God stand behind the pulpit and preach the word of God and their soul was convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit but they resisted God and resisted the Holy Spirit and they died lost and they are now remembering every time every day, every moment that they had a chance and they turned it away. Hell is full, by the way, of religious people. Did you know that? Religious people who went to church, who had their names on the book, who prayed the prayers, who sang the songs, but in their heart, they never gave Jesus Christ uh, a chance they never accepted Him in their life to be saved. You see, beloved, listen, good people don't go to hell. Did you know that? That sounds good, doesn't it? Good people don't go to hell. Saved people do. That have been washed in the blood of the Lamb and have been born again by the Spirit of God. So, beloved, there is fire in hell. 
that we need in the church. You see, that fire that we need in the church starts with Jesus. John the Baptist said in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, he said, I indeed baptize you. He was talking with Christ because remember John the Baptist baptized Jesus. He said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. We live in a time... And I've seen it, and some of you older folks have seen it. I'm 57, by the way. And I know what you're saying. Well, Brian, you don't even look 37. <laughs> Thanks. That's deeply appreciated. And if I shave my beard, I'm 10 years younger than that. But we live in an age now where many of our free will Baptist churches are dead. And they are dried up. And they have turned into social clubs, not the house of God. With no power in their service. Why? Because the fire has gone out and many are no longer walking with the Lord. I can name a church right now in Pike County. If I named it, every one of you would know where it's at. They got about eight people. The youth group is at the ripe age of 75 years old. That church is going to die. Soon, that church will close the doors. Why? Somehow or another, they failed to make necessary changes. Somehow or another, the fire that maybe they had in the 50s and the 60s have gone out. And so there is fire in hell that we need in the church. I'm reminded of a story about a man who had not been in church in three weeks. It was a dead of winter, February. Got a knock on the door one night. He opened the door and he said, Oh, pastor, it's good to see you. Come on in. The pastor never said a word to his parishioner. He came right in, walked over by the fire. Got one of the, the instruments that where you move the fire around with Coal. He grabbed a piece of coal that was on fire, burning bright, and pulled it away from the fire about five feet. Just in a few minutes, that piece of coal started burning out and diminished and was no longer on fire. The pastor took the coal again and put it back with the fire. And within another minute or so, it was back burning again. Above the moral of that story, and by the way, the pastor walked out the door, never said a word to his, his church member, and the church member said, Pastor, thank you for that wonderful message. And the moral of the story is, is beloved, uh, if you want to be a fired up, if you want to have a fired up church, be a fired up church member. Do not allow yourself to get out of church because when you do, it will cause you uh, the fire in your heart and in your soul to burn out and you'll be dead and dried up spiritually. Stay in church. Go to church every time the door is open. I prayed that prayer for my three children. They're all grown adults now. And you know what? They go to church every time the doors open, every one of them. Now, <clears throat> I praise God for that. But you know what? I prayed it that way. When they were in the womb, I prayed that my children would know the Lord and that, that they would love the Lord, and that they would live for Him, and that they would worship Him, and that they would be governed by His Word all the days of their life. And I also prayed that God would give them good Christian husbands and wives. And so, beloved, listen. When you pray it that way for years and years when they become adults and you see that your prayers have been answered, all we can say is thank God. But keep yourself on fire for God because there's fire in hell that we need in the church. 
Number four, we also see that there's concern in hell. Look at verse 28. The Bible says, he, uh, uh, the, the rich man who had went to hell, he said, for I have five brethren. That, uh, well, first he said, uh, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him to my father's house. I have five brethren that may testify of them, lest they come to this place of torment. So we find that in hell, they was concerned for the lost. And beloved, we, we need to have concern for the lost today. He wanted to see his brother saved before it was everlasting too late. And so I'm reminded of what Paul said in Romans chapter 9 when Paul said uh, in verse 1, he said, I say a truth. Let's stop there. Number one, Paul said, I say a truth. He wasn't lying. And he even mentions that. He said, I lie not. Okay? Let's get this soaked in before we get to what he says. I'm going to tell you the truth, what I'm about to say. I lie not. He said, also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost bared witness with Paul that what he was about to say was true. And this is what he said. He said, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Okay, I get that. That's good. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. You know what Paul was saying there? He said, if God would let me, I love my brethren Israel so much that I would die for them and go to hell for all of them. And that's a great and mighty incredible statement. But Jesus already paid it all on the cross. It was not necessary for Paul to do that. But Paul said, I become all things to all men that I might win them and save them. To the Jew, I become the, uh, a Jew. To them that are of the law and without the law. To them who are weak, I become weak. That I uh, may by some way see men saved. I remember my first church years ago, Sophia, West Virginia. Wow. I was so young, I didn't bother to ask any questions when I took the church. You know, what the level of unity was and what was going on. And I didn't know it, but I went into a hornet's nest. It was the church from hell. I'm telling you. But while I was there, one day there's a young couple come to our church and had, they had three children. Well, you know, any pastor that has the right heart, he's excited about that. Amen, pastor. Yeah. So I go to their house that week to visit them and let them know that I really appreciated them coming to our church. So I get there and I don't know why, but the kids were playing basketball. And where the basketball goal was, there was a big pile of coal. I don't get that, but that's how they were playing. Well, I had my suit and tie on. You know, back then, uh, us free will Baptists, we wore suits and ties. And matter of fact, I remember the day when I was when I first got saved at the Southside Free Will Baptist Church in Paintsville. Uh, it was a whole different dress code than it is today. But that's all right. I'm just telling you the way it was. It's okay. But I remember I was there in my suit and tie, and the first thing I did because I love basketball, I went out and started playing with those boys. Well, after about thirty minutes. One of the kids started laughing at me and said, Hi, preacher, you look like a black man. I had coal dust from the top of my head all the way down to the bottom of my feet. My suit was, uh, was just totally ruined. So I went over to the door, knocked on the, the couple's door, and they both come out, and I'm going to tell you, they looked at me and their eyeballs went like this. They were big as saucers. And I said, well, I just wanted to let you know I've been playing basketball with your boys, but I wanted to let you know I'm so glad that you come to church Sunday and uh, we really appreciate you being there. That next week, they came and they got saved uh, and I baptized them. And after all these years, they are still at that church today. Why? Because for whatever care that I had, for whatever love that I had, for whatever concern that I had for that family, uh, uh, it, it impressed them. 
I became all things to all men like Paul did here that I might win them. And there's still, thank God, in church today. Somehow we need to see uh, what the rich man saw, what Paul saw, and what Jesus sees. That we see, uh, we need to see a world on its way to hell and that we are the only ones that can make a difference in the lives of a lost and ungodly. Folks, we're living in ungodly, wicked, perverse rebellion against God today. Never seen anything like it in my life. But God's Word said it would be that way in the last days. And here we are. So folks, there is concern in hell that we need in the church. Last point real quickly. There are sinners in hell that we need in the church. I'm reminded in Luke chapter 18, the religious uh, Pharisee went to the house of God and there's a publican there that went to the house of God. The Bible says that the, the, the Pharisee stood when he prayed. He didn't humble himself before the Lord. He didn't bow down before God, but he prayed and boasted of his clean life. He boasted about... Uh, uh, fasting, he boasted about tithing, he saw no flaws in himself uh, and, but Jesus made it clear that day that he was uh, uh, unsaved and because that, that publican that day went out of the house of God unjustified but the, the publican that was there bowed his head, put his hand over his chest and said, O Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. And on that day, that man went out of the house of God justified. Why? Because, beloved, in order for anyone to get saved today, they must humble themselves before an almighty God. I'm reminded of the moral sinner in Mark chapter 10 about the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus one time and said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And and Jesus said, well, have you kept the commandments? He said, yes, Lord. I've kept the commandments all the way, all the days up to my youth. So he came to the right person, Jesus. He came to the, in the right way. The Bible says that this rich young ruler kneeled down before Jesus. He asked the right question. What can I do uh, to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gave him the right answer. He said, go and sell all that you have and come and follow me. Well, the Bible says this moral young man good man remember good people don't go to hell saved people do he went away sorrowfully the Bible says why? because he had another God in his life and that was the God of wealth and possessions so beloved we need to remember that Jesus wants all of your heart not just part of it But if you come to Him with a broken heart and a contrite spirit and you mean business with God, He will in no wise cast you out. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So beloved, we need sinners in the church. Invite them to come. Let your light shine before them. Be their light. Be their salt. Now what does salt do? Well, salt makes you thirsty. People need to look at us as born-again Bible-believing Christians and say, I want what that man or that woman has in their life. So we need to be the salt of the earth that they will see and that they will be thirsty and hungry for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. So in conclusion this morning, there's five or six things here in hell that we need in the church. And my prayer is this morning, this message mainly was for you, the saints, because we need these things in our church. But if you're here and you're lost, friend, you need to understand that hell is real. Heaven is real. Hell is real also. Matter of fact, there's more in the Bible, in Scriptures, that teach about hell than it does about heaven. They're both real, and they're both for all eternity. And by the way, there's no in-between. 
when, when a soul dies today, you are either going to heaven or you are going to hell. That's the end of it. There's no going back. There's no time to repent. Death causes you to go into an eternal state. And that state is all up to you, my friend. You get to decide. Jesus will not force His will upon you. That's why another reason why we're called free will Baptists, because we believe in the free will. God wants you to get saved and worship Him by the act of your free will. Let's all stand. I'm going to ask those who would play an invitation to come forward and we'll give an invitation this morning. We don't know anybody's heart here. Uh, and.